What's going on, everybody? Happy Thursday. Thanks for joining me back here on The Big Thing. Christian Harloff here. Uh, there's a lot of stories, a lot of stories going on, whether it's this big one I'm talking about here with the Hogwarts legacy. Is it going to be a TV show? There's rumors that Cursed Child was going to be a movie. Well, are they going to do a TV show now with, with the popularity that is the video game? Are they going to make it an actual TV series? I don't know. Well, they're also talking about TV series that aren't going to happen. True Blood, it was supposed to be a spinoff, ain't going to happen. And there's a spinoff of uh, Succession that was talked about, ain't going to happen, apparently, if you hear it from the HBO Max execs' mouth. Um, the Flash, it's screening at CinemaCon. That's a big piece of news, man. And speaking of DC, Shazam, it ain't tracking too well. But I'll tell you something, it is tracking very well. And that's Rebel Moon. That's Zack Snyder's big science fiction film that comes out at the end of the year. Well, I got an opportunity to talk to one of the stars of that film, Cleopatra Coleman. Cleopatra came in and sat down with me inside studio, and we talked for about a half an hour. Now, I'm telling you right now, she didn't really talk much about Rebel Moon. She can't, not allowed to. But she's been in a lot of cool stuff, man. She's in Infinity Pool. She's in a film called A Lot of Nothing. She was in Dope Sick, um, Last Man on Earth. There's a lot, and she is really a cool, cool person. She really is. I'd, I'd never met her before, but she came in and we sat down. We just talked for half an hour, very just down to earth. Um, like just, it was very easy to talk to. I felt like I was just having coffee with somebody and just kind of shooting the, the ish. And th that will be in, in today's show. So I'll get to sh show you that. I want, I'd love for more people to um, learn about her and what, what she's doing because I think she's a she's a megastar and she's going to be doing a lot of great stuff and especially with Rebel Moon coming out. So that interview will be up in just a little bit. So it's a really fun episode. Yes, both Roxy and Brett not on the show today. This is kind of a single week of me. So I know you might be getting sick of just me, but deal with it. Um, we, we've got a pretty good, uh, pretty good slate here today, so I'm pretty excited about it. All right, and before we get into anything else, as I mentioned to you guys before, not only are we on Apple, on Spotify, and on video. People have been really watching the video on Spotify. I love that. I'm hearing a lot of stuff. Every time I, if I, if I'm a little late on posting the Spotify episode, ooh, man, do I hear it, and I like it. I like that here. Got some merch. Yeah, man, get a Big Thing shirt. Get a Big Thing sweatshirt. It's on sale right now, by the way. You can go on over there, go to the link in the description, head on over to the Big Thing uh, page and get yourself one of these sweatshirts, get yourself a, a t-shirt, sticker, a mug, whatever it might be. Show a little class and do it. Speaking of show a little class, hit that subscribe button. Trying to get us to 70,000, man. We're almost there. Patreon.com slash the big thing. All right, let's get into it. Cleopatra Coleman on the show today. I'm ready. You're ready. It's the big thing. Let's do it. Ready? Cool. Boom. What's going on, everybody? Thanks for joining me. I told you a ton of stuff today to talk about and a really fun episode to boot. Good interview. I always like meeting new people, and especially when there's like, so Perry and Emeroff reached out and said, hey, would you be interested in sitting down and talking to Cleopatra Coleman? And I'm like, yeah, man, because I'm pumped about Rebel Moon. I want to see what that's all about. But then I had a chance to see some of her other stuff. And you just tell when someone's got that thing, she's got that thing. So I'm excited for you guys to see the, the conversation that we had. I'll show you in a little bit here. But um, I did, you know, my review for Cocaine Bear is up right now, non-spoiler. By the time this comes out, the embargo will have lifted. So I'll just give you, again, my thoughts if you haven't seen the review itself. Um, I was really hoping to love this movie. I really was. I thought it could just be batshit crazy with, and it is, it is, it is definitely crazy. But I guess, I guess with the idea of a, of a blend of, I understand what they're going for. Let's make it funny, even though it's it's kind of sucks what happened to the bear. Poor bear wasn't was looking for some honey, and then it got some honey. But you know what I mean. It's like, and then um, they, I thought, okay, they're going to turn into this kind of crazy comedy because if you think about it, a bear all hopped up on cocaine running around the joint could be really silly and wacky. And they hit some of that wackiness, but it's just I don't know. Some of the jokes just don't hit. And for me, the way that it played, I had a. Um, <sighs> It, it, to me, it had a really, to, the tone was all over the place. 
And it didn't really, I felt it didn't really know what it wanted to be. Like there are times that it feels like a full on slasher kind of horror, gory film where you're supposed to feel like, oh, and then like the next scene, they're like, yeah, but we want you to really laugh now. Like I'm still recovering from that last scene. Something happens in, you know, in a tree. I'll just say that. And I was watching going, oh, this isn't it. Sometimes it's like, it's not easy to watch. And then there's other times, no, but this is funny. And it's like, yeah, but I'm so, I'm kind of traumatized from that last thing. And some people might like that. Some people might, might really, I, I think this is going to be one where people go, what do you expect? It's cocaine beer. You go into the movie knowing it's a bizarre film. It's just a matter of whether the tone does it for you or not. So, you know, nonetheless, it's a, it's still, it's, it's a, I think counter programming to stuff that's out right now. So. Take it as you will. Enjoy it. Don't enjoy it. What can I tell you? You got your own mind, right? Cool. This week's pretty awesome when it comes to the stuff we got going on because not only do we have Cleopatra on today's show, tomorrow we have Katie O'Brien on the show. On It's going to be Capes and Cows, but again, it's going to be me, but Capes and Cows, we have um, Katie O'Brien who, if you know Katie O'Brien, she is in... She is in Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. And she's also in The Mandalorian. She's also in Mandalorian, Mandalorian Season 3. So that'll be on tomorrow's show. She was in for about 15, 20 minutes. Got a good chance to talk. And then um, on Monday, speaking of Mandalorian, Katie Sackhoff is on the show. Full episode with Katie. A little over an hour and 10 minutes. Myself, Katie, and, and Brett Sheridan as we prep to watching The Mandalorian Season 3. And then on on Tuesday, I'll have a, my, an immediate reaction, an out-of-the-theater reaction, because I'm going to see a screening of The Mandalorian Season 3, Episode 1, maybe Episode 2, but I would assume Episode 1, on um, on Tuesday night. So I'll have an out-of-the-theater reaction for that one when I see it. And then, obviously, a lot of coverage for that. We'll have The, we'll have the Last of Us spoiler review for Episode 7, I think it is, this Sunday, and... It, Lots going on for the channel, man. Then Scream 3, I'm go- Scream 3, Scream 6, I'm going to see that coming up. Um, so I'll have an out of the theater for that. I'll have reviews for that. Creed, by the way, Creed 3, um, the review for that should be up tomorrow morning around 9 a.m. Then that will lead into Capes and Cows a little later. Lots of short form I've been playing um, on the channel, so you can check that out. We just did a kind of greatest hits for the big thing. Uh, people liked it, really liked it. So maybe we'll do a few more of those kind of funny funny moments from the show and put them on the shorts. All right, let's get into some of this news. We'll start with the the one that is leading the show, and that's this Hogwarts thing, man. The Hogwarts thing. This is, they're definitely, now when there's this much smoke, there's fire, right? They're trying to figure out what they can do. They need more IPs, Warner Brothers, so they're trying really browsing around the Harry Potter world and the Hogwarts world. And this is something that Roxy Stryer said years ago that they should be doing a Harry Potter series and, and they should. And so this is a new report at Scooper's giant freaking robot. And it claims claims that HBO max TV series based on the just released Hogwarts legacy video game, which itself is inspired by the Harry Potter franchise is in development at the streamer. The site says that the series is still in early phases and like the game itself, it will be set well before the events of both Harry Potter and the Fantastic Beast franchise. It's set in the 1800s. The game has players stepping into the shoes of a student at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry who has a rare ability to tap into ancient magic. The game has been a smash hit since its release on all the platforms uh, on February 10th with receiving good reviews in a statement last week to Variety, Warner Brothers Games, David Haddad says, we are very pleased with the initial launch and see a bright future for other platform launches. He also adds that the player engagement is spectacular. So far, we have tracked over 152 million hours played, 173 million magical plants grown, 150 million potions, yada, yada, yada. The title also enjoyed the biggest European launch outside of the FIFA and Call of Duty series since Red Dead Redemption in 2018. Okay, so, yeah, man, look, when you have the IP and as it's, as it's playing... Um, it's it's doing really well, and I think after The Last of Us, people are going to start to tap into these games, and hopefully, hopefully, what The Last of Us has done is get people to realize that you can adapt things still 
maneuver away from make makes things a little different you know kind of a pivot away but still keeping it to its core because that's what last of us does i've been playing the game and i'm and i'm caught up i'm actually a little bit past where we are. I'm, I'm approaching spoiler territory for where i am in last of us but for the most part there's some really good changes i think from the game and things that may make it better and 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 some things that you know i could see where the audience is like oh i wish they would have kept that particular detail in there but overall what they've done and the way that they've maneuvered around it and they've kept the creator on and, and done like that's the kind of stuff you need to do and i think that if they you know i don't i haven't played this game yet so i hope that they stick with the if if it's the story itself that is what is fun i don't know I mean, for people who play the game you guys tell me but if the story itself is the thing that is kind of cap captivating people to play it, then that's what they should adapt, obviously. But if it's the stuff that you just feel like you're in the castle and it's that kind of f throwback to what made the original so, um, I don't know, that connected everybody to them, what is it exactly that people are, are gravitating towards? I want to play the game and I want to double check it and see. So you can see why HBO is, is going to do this um why they would want to do why would they would want to do this and the fact that it's almost like star wars with the old republic right you're putting or or new republic i guess with the acolyte you're putting it so far away from anything else that you've done the prequels i guess in this case would be fantastic beasts and they're not finishing that series but going back into hogwarts and playing into that side of it is what they need to do in general now if they there was another report that was recent that said that they're also thinking about adapting cursed child and making that a movie with the original cast so there's a lot i think like i said there's just a lot of reports coming out about this right now so whether or not it's going to happen or not i don't know but i'll tell you one of the things i've been telling you guys about I'm talking about it and this is something i want to address i addressed it on sith council yesterday um i'll address it here too i had a response to, to somebody who had, who had said about the sponsors when we talk about sponsors and it's like hey man i've been watching you for a long time and um and i really like your stuff and i watch every video that you do but um i gotta I mean, be honest you know it's like every sponsor that you have it's like you love it you love the sponsor and how, and how, how can i believe it because i only take sponsors that i like i only take sponsors when we get pitched stuff all of the time we get pitched stuff all of the time which is a great problem to have we get pitched stuff all the time but it's like if if i don't feel like it's something that myself or anybody on my show will use or like or enjoy and that the audience won't like like you you guys are going to know whether it's, it's you got you try it and you don't like it. I, I tried this thing that you I, th this i have not seen from people that i that i have talked that i've the stuff that have been on the show i have not seen someone go hey i tried this and you weren't telling the truth this stuff stinks i have seen you know it didn't work for me the same way that it worked for you but i can understand i've seen that stuff for sure but I, I, I'm not doing that. There's certain stuff that I won't take. And there's certain stuff that has offered money to say, like, and, and good money. But it's just not to my standards. It's not to something that I feel that I would use. So I don't tell you guys about it. But that's why when I heard from Magic Mind, I said, yeah, look, Magic Mind is a, um, it was something that we had on SEN. And, um, and Brett had tried it. So they had reached out and they said, hey, listen, why don't you give us a shot? And if you like us, you know, we want to do something together. So I did. And I'll tell you exactly about Magic Mind. I'm telling you, man, like I have, I don't, so the first time we had Magic Mind, it was with, during SEN. And Brett had, um, had, Brett was the one that was using it. He, he was raving about it. And I hadn't had a chance to try it. And they reached out to me. And I said, look, yeah, I have, I have problems with the, a lot of times kind of procrastination and my mind goes all over the place. And I, my biggest problem is I try, I focus on 7,000 things at once and they're like, give us a shot. And I said, all right, well, I got to try it first before I start telling the audience about it. Cause that's just not what I do. I want to, I want to make sure that I really like it. And if I don't like it, I got to be honest with you guys. And, and I tried it and I found myself focusing and I found myself more so. Uh, and I, and in, a couple of times before I went to, um, I'm, I get tired uh, at the, uh, you know, the, the end of the day when I'm trying to work and I'm like, and I'm all over the place and my, and I've been able to just kind of focus a little bit more. It's I've just been, it's, it's had about three days, three or four days. I think that when I really started seeing the, the effects of it, you just do like kind of one shot of it, 
tastes pretty good too. Um, anyway, so if you want to check it out, it's the links in the description. It's Magic Mind, and you can use my code Christian twenty to get forty three percent off your first subscription in the next uh, ten days. You go to Magic Mind dot co slash christian and use that code christian 20 to get uh yeah 43 percent off all right once again thank you to our friends over at magic mind really i'm telling you like sometimes i'm scattered all over the place so it's really it was it's been great have definitely seen the effects of it and um check it out do the research for yourself all right moving on to the next one next story here now i'm headed to CinemaCon this year and i'm pretty excited about it there they show the big movies, and The Flash is one of the big ones that they're showing this year. And I couldn't be more stoked. There's some dark horizons. The report is that for a while, we've been hearing now that Warner Brothers has been bullish about The Flash film due to rave reactions out of test screenings. The studio is now putting its money where its mouth is, with The Hollywood Reporter rep uh, reporting that the film will premiere in its entirety at this year's CinemaCon in late April. So it is the convention of theater, owner, theater owners from the 24th to the 27th of April and will show the film to a packed audience of thousands a full seven weeks before its theatrical release on June 16th. With the reaction bound to get out from the screening, Warners appears to be confident enough in the final product that they're not worried about the reaction getting out so early. Last year, Paramount used CinemaCon to launch Top Gun Maverick, which got big reviews, and that certainly helps. So maybe that's their strategy behind it. Um this is pretty great. I'm loving this. I love that we're getting The Flash at CinemaCon. I've never been before. I've always wanted to go. Ellis and I, when we were doing Schmoes, we never did it. We always talked about it, but we never did it. And it was the one that we probably should have done the most out of all of them. But I'll be honest, like Comic-Con and, and even Star Wars Celebration and all those, I'm, I'm a big fan of them. I've done them a bunch of times. But for Comic-Con, especially now with what I do for my channel, I had such like an up and down relationship as far as work goes with with San Diego Comic Con. When Mark and I started doing Comic Con in like um, I think it was like 2012, and that was with Fandango and at TimeMovies.com, we did a bunch of like lists and talked to people there. So it was it was a lot of work where we were on the floor doing that stuff. So we needed to be there for certain things. And then as we started to do more with Schmoes and Comic Con. We would get into Hall H, and we do a lot of Hall H stuff, and all the footage was pretty much exclusive, and they didn't release a lot to the to the public, so we would cover stuff, and and it was before trailer reactions even really kind of popped to the way that the kind of the, the business, honestly, that it is now. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you know, the, the they started to release trailers around the same time as they released them there is still exclusive footage there's no doubt about it and there was a lot at celebration there was a lot at comic-con but they released a lot of the trailers at the same time to get people kind of pumped up about what's going on there and for me for for this channel and, and, and in general it, it actually makes more sense it actually is it's harder for me to grow the channel and get my word out there uh if i'm doing you know if there's like a big let's say let's say there's an acolyte trailer that drops for a celebration and I'm in the convention hall when it happens and I don't put my kind of trailer reaction out there first. It's, it's tougher. It's tougher to kind of grow the audience with it. I, I shouldn't necessarily say that with celebration though, too, because even though I didn't get a chance to get those reactions and everything out there first, I had a lot of, I mean, that, that was a, that was a pretty big month as far as views went. Cause I was, I guess I got the John Williams thing and, and it's like, again, that exclusive stuff, but it's, it's a balance of what you want to try to do with it in general. So, but I've done it, I guess I've also done Comic-Con and Celebration so many times and I've never done CinemaCon. And I just think that the fact that they're, they show so much stuff. And I mean, The Flash, I assume Guardians of the Galaxy, Mission Impossible, if I was to guess. So I wanted to go check it out do the kind of out of the theater reactions then because I've also gotten a lot of feedback from you guys that that's one of the things on the channel that you guys are enjoying the most. So to get an out of the theater, the flash and when the flash comes in, because that movie comes out the week before we leave to go to New York and then Stanford, we're, we're going to be doing both of those clubs for the big thing, which I'll have more information on very, very soon. Um, but yeah, it's uh 
it, it's it, there's that's that's pretty exciting and it does show the confidence that Warner Brothers has in it and I think because if you look at the strategy of what certain movies did there last year as they mentioned in your article Top Gun it, ma- it makes a lot of sense so what say you guys you think this is a good move for them to show it at CinemaCon I'm very curious to hear what you think Warner Brothers making some moves overall first two stories Warner Brothers stories and we'll get into another one in a little bit with Shazam but before we even do any of that um, I've been telling you guys, you guys have been asking me about both Athletic Greens and Green Chef. And I'll tell you about both of them right now. Green Chef, I mean, this is the one that people have been asking me about a lot. They've been asking me about it a lot because they're like, hey, I noticed that you lost weight. Is that true? I said, yes, it is true. And I've been really using this Green Chef once they, and as I mentioned earlier, I only take sponsors on that i believe in so i tried them out and man and what i i mean look they they send you menus and things that are very easy for you to make i make my own stuff also with the stuff that they send i've been making like these stir fries which is really great um green chef is the number one meal kit is for eating well with dinners that work for you not the other way around and they have options for every type of lifestyle their recipes feature premium proteins seasonal organic produce and they have sourced sea- seafood you can expand your palate with unique farm fresh ingredients like figs dates artichokes so much green chef is the only meal kit that is both carbon and plastic offset they offset 100 percent of their carbon footprint as well as 100 percent of the plastic in every box 100 percent of the seafood meets the monterey bay aquarium seafood watch rankings of certified best choice or good alternative green chef you're re- you're not you are reducing your food waste by up to 38 percent versus grocery shopping i've definitely noticed a a, a lot a, i mean the, the i couldn't tell you i the freaking chicken that they sent it was so tasty. It was so good. They offer 10-minute lunches. They have each week's menu includes two convenient low prep and nutritious lunch recipes and they're ready in just 10 minutes. It's true. No cooking required. Perfect for when you're on the go and press for time in the office. You can eat well at lunchtime too. So if you want to head on over and you want to do it, you gotta go go to greenchef.com slash thing sixty. And you know why it's thing sixty? To get sixty percent off. Plus free shipping. That was the deal. It was like sixty percent off, sixty percent off plus free shipping. You got to go to greenchef.com slash thing sixty. Athletic Greens. I love Athletic Greens so much. I love them. AG One by Athletic Greens, man. They're so good. They're so good. And this is the other one. The other. This is my wife. This morning takes it takes all these vitamins, and I go, "How do you do that? I I can't take a whole bunch of vitamins. I like doing it all in one shot. And that's what I do with Athletic Greens. I love it. I take it all the time." Every day, you guys know that. I mean, how long I've been talking about Athletic Greens now? Athletic Greens, it's it's better gut health. It's increased energy. It's you know, for me, it's the sleep quality. That's what I've been doing. The sleep quality is the best. You can do it right. You can whether you're working out or before you're making your coffee, whatever you're doing, it's you feel ready to go. And it's it's like it's the health kick. It really is between my my diet that I have, which I'll tell you about later, and then uh, and Athletic Greens. I've been doing good. I've been, I've been having good energy. People have been noticing that. I like that. It helped me with my energy. And why do you want to take a whole bunch of different things? You just take this and that's it. You put it in a, I take it in a bottle of water and I shake it up and I love it. And AG1 was designed with ease in mind so you can live healthier and better with having to do a lot. People love it. Uh, Katie Sackhoff is, like I said, she's coming in on Monday. And I talked about Athletic Greens on the show and she loves Athletic Greens. And I'll talk, and she, I'm going to leave that in the show when she says it, of course. It's delivered to me every month, very easy to make it a daily habit. So if you're looking for an easier way to take supplements, Athletic Greens, it gives you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. But you have to go to athleticgreens.com slash big thing. Athleticgreens.com slash big thing. Look, the reason why I wanted to also show both Green Chef and Athletic Greens is because um, people have been asking me, man, like, you know, I've the last few months I've been trying to take care of myself a little bit better than I had been doing obviously the vitamins and with one shot with athletic greens and eating better with with um with green chef and i, I make that stir fry that i mentioned and so those are those, again three sponsors in here that i really really dig and i really really think that you guys will enjoy so if you want to help out the show and you want to help out yourselves try any one of the sponsors that i mentioned to you guys today i put the link in the um in the description but i also pin it as the first comment 
So if you do try any of them, it, whether you want to respond to the top comment or whether you want to just let me know separately, please let me know. I'm very curious to hear what you guys think uh, and, and if, if you're enjoying what you got. All right, I do want to get to that Shazam thing, but I also want you guys to really, you got to see this interview. You got to see this interview with um, with Cleopatra. She is, what a cool name, and I tell her as much inside of this. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a really big fan already just from talking to her. As I mentioned in my intro, I felt like I was just having, just sitting down talking to someone like a coffee shop. And we had a really great conversation. I tried to get some stuff out of Rebel Moon, but, you know, she's not giving anything, nor should she. she don't get her, get her in trouble. But anyway, enjoy my conversation here with her, and then I'd love to hear your comments about it. And then when we get back from the interview, we'll go a little bit more into the Shazam stuff and how it's tracking, but please enjoy my interview here with Cleopatra Coleman. Enjoy. All right, everybody. I'm excited. My next guest. You might know her from Dope Sick, Last Man on Earth. She's got um, a lot of other things coming out. We know, and I'm not going to be able to ask you anything about it, so don't start thinking, oh, you're going to ask a lot about Rebel Moon. Don't worry about it. You know it when it comes out. It comes out in December. Uh, a Lot of Nothing is an infinity pool. They're all movies that my next guest has been in a television show as well. Please. Welcome, Cleopatra Coleman. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. Yeah. For a lot of different reasons. One, because um, I might have just been a fly on a wall in a conversation one time when you were there. And my daughter, who is, I have two, and I have one that is um, five years old, and she is very much into ballet and dancing. Rumor has it that's how you started. And that's yeah. what you wanted to do. Um, <laughs> so, and I just wanted to talk to you about that because at some point, when you're you're dancing and you know and younger younger and I can't remember anything when I was younger and like do you have kind of vivid memories of that and knowing or I mean how did that start out that you first kind of fell in love with dancing? I do. I, I remember going to a class at age four and just feeling like this was something I needed to continue doing to the point where I told my parents that's what I will be doing, and uh, we did a performance. It was an under the sea themed performance and i just remember the feeling of being on stage yeah yeah that's i mean it's amazing how like there's just certain things especially and i'm sure you know your parents can see it in you like there's my my oldest daughter responds to the performance side and acting and everything too and but my my youngest just responds to music like it just mm -hmm. it's in her like i have there's a bunch of people in my family that are musically inclined and it's like you just know that it's there you have both you have both so and at what point do you decide you know it's time for me to incorporate both because your your performance in in the step up. That well, was, I didn't dance. I you played didn't, the DJ, just which is so funny because yeah, I was like a dancer at the time. But I well, that's what that's kind of what were you? Did you get the role though because of your dance background or no? It was just because yeah, I, yeah. That's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah, people, yeah, that had a dance background, right. but then ended up not dancing at all. It's which is <laughs> which is interesting for that particular film. But I mean, I just want to know, like, at at some point though, when you're when you're there as a dancer going. No, it's time that I'm going to really go after the acting side of it. I want to perform, and and I also know that your parents are very supportive of it. That's a trick, though. That's that's the main trick because if it's not, it's another battle you have to deal with. If you don't have that, it's less baggage to worry about. One hundred percent agree. I'm super grateful that I have these amazing creative expansive thinkers for parents that were always super encouraging of my creativity yeah. and like whatever my intuition told me I needed to do like that's been a huge gift in my life and has made everything possible um and also just like exposure to art and film and, yeah. and things like that are you only child yeah I have okay. a half older brother but okay. yeah pretty much and and what so what so what is the do you have a relationship with the half older brother yeah or, so is he in the uh, arts as well too or no 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 he isn't I think he could have been if he wanted to yeah yeah, yeah. what's his name because you have a cool ass name yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's like I was wondering like what what is his first if you if you I don't his know if you talk about Jonathan Jonathan okay Cleopatra and Jonathan, how did Cleopatra come about is it my mother's name is turquoise awesome so yeah I love your <laughs> I mean I would say uh, that I had a chance to meet your dad what a, yes. what a, and, and just the fact that alone to me like when I met you to meet your dad when he comes in that says a lot it says the relationship it says that still after everything you've already accomplished 
that he's right there by your side and he wants to see it. I mean, how, how, so it seems like you're pretty close with, with your, with your pops and yeah. your family in general. Yeah. Well, it's funny you should say that because on the way over here, we were driving over here and my dad's visiting from Australia right now. And I was like, oh, this is like a flashback to my early auditions in Australia where dad and I would walk together. He would walk with me to all my auditions so cool. and wait in the waiting room and he would run lines with me and yeah. Well, that's what I mean, though, because it's like I, I, I have had many interviews where it was the opposite. It was like they wanted me to do this and they wanted to do that. And it's like, as I mentioned, you just get to that point where like I have so much that I have to focus on here, knowing what I have inside of me and believing in myself is as much of a challenge as anything else. I need you to believe in me. So when they have that, that's just now you got to were you are you a person that always believed in yourself, had self-doubt? What what was it like? Um. I've always had, it's twofold. I, I've always had a pretty strong idea about what I needed to do. Like, I, I don't know, I felt like I just had received a message of like, you do this. And then I would tell my parents and they were like, okay, let's see how we can make that yeah. work. But also like growing up in Australia, in that industry, I didn't look like anyone. I was very unusual also in my approach to acting and just my performance. And that won me roles, but at the same time, you feel like such an outlier. And I think sometimes when you're a little different, you can often feel like you're not enough. Right. Like it mimics the same feeling mm -hmm. when people don't really know how to talk about you or approach you or even hire you. They don't know where to put you. And right. so it, it ends up feeling like the same as if you didn't have any talent. Yeah, I can say it is. I, again, I mean, that's comes in. I did stand up comedy for a very long time. So it's like, it's always, you have a confidence in yourself and you have a thing inside of yourself, but it's always like, well, what if this, and you're looking at me that way and I have to now, and you can't concentrate on the work as much until you do. And yeah. so that's and I, the one that I have to talk to you about is a lot of nothing. Mm -hmm. So I watch the opening scene and right away, cause I've seen you do so much different stuff. You've done yeah. comedies, you've done, I mean this, and this is a, this is, this is, this is deep material. Like when, I mean, the opening scene alone, you really get an idea who Vanessa is. I mean, you just, you just do. Tell me what it was like playing, um, playing this character and how do you approach it? And, and, and first of all, the script, when you get the script going, oh, I, I want to do this or let me read it more. Let me hear from the director first. What's that whole entire process like? Well, when I read the script, I was like, okay, this is a character I've been waiting 20 years to play. Um, it was so full of nuance and it was so symbolic and so complex and she was just like volatile at times, vulnerable at times, someone that I was like, oh, let me just, I want to like get in her skin and yeah. I fought for that role. Why, why is it a role that you want, were waiting for for 20 years? Well, because I think she speaks to certain specific identity themes mm -hmm. to do with being biracial, to do with being a woman, um, all of the socio-political aspects. It was like, it was the film itself. We always talked about macro and micro yeah, and these like massive, massive themes, but then zooming in on this one house and this particular couple that are like so fallible, so flawed. Um, and then watching how it just all kind of like explodes as, as the film goes on and how each person in the film, like their personal issues get roped up in this massive situation and these massive themes. And, it, you know, it was just a role where, you know, because it's a satire, it had comedic timing elements that I, you know, was familiar with and also, you know, just love doing. Mm -hmm. And then these really dramatic elements and this really, really personal story that I just was like, I, I love this person. I want to represent her. Yeah. And I, and what I liked about it is I went to, I went to Florida State uh, Theater School. So like there were times that I did, I felt like, and this is, this is the, a, a big compliment where I felt like I was watching a, um, a really good scene on stage, you know, like, yeah. like and it was kind of like, especially the opening with yes. just two really great actors just kind of feeling each other out. It didn't feel like acting. It felt like this couple that had these issues and had to talk it out, but I would just felt like it was like I was watching a really good stage play at that particular scene. Especially. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, we worked really hard on that. That was a 17 minute one take wow. scene and wow. it really did feel like theater. There were moments where, you know, out of the corner of my eye, I could see art department pulling tables out of the way and then hiding. It was like we scheduled one whole night to do that scene. Yeah. We did it 11 times. And I think we ended up using the seventh take. Um, 
some of the crew cried at the end because it just felt like such a it was I mean it's always a team effort filmmaking yeah. but it w- really like crystallized how much it's such a team effort and you know there were just so many things that needed to happen right at the right time and and it was really a special moment and I think it strengthened it it sharpened my my acting in a way that I've been able to take with me in 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 other projects well it seems like you're doing that with every role that you're taking right because I mean even when you look at um last man on earth with this I mean, Will alone, right? With the, the comedy that's that's in that show, and you bring it, like you said, this isn't a comedy per se, but you're you still it's satire. Yeah. And did you feel that that tool from Last Man on Earth was yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, the thing I learned the most on Last Man on Earth, other than you know the comedy, which is hard, comedy is yeah. not easy. Um, but I learned to let go because these are like it's SNL writers, right? So mm-hmm. we're getting the script like on a Monday and we're doing a table read off of a script we haven't even glanced at. It's still warm from the printer. And so very, and we did that for four years. So very, very quickly I had to learn how to like throw away any like notions of control that I thought I had and just really like, and, and it's pressuring because you have members of the crew and then you have executives in the front row. And if you don't land the joke, it might get cut. You know, there's an element to that as well. So yeah, I just had to really um, just embrace it, and that's something I've taken with me as well. Yeah, it's 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 it really is impressive. Like when I was going through, I was looking at a lot of the stuff that you've done, and I've seen a lot of the stuff too. But it was the it's the just the difference in material and the stuff because you know a lot of times you don't see you see a lot of people like to play in one particular lane because it's yeah. comfortable to them. Yeah, and I felt even self conscious about that at times yeah. in my career where I'm like, do I need to pick a lane? And then I've learned to embrace the fact that that's what my career is like. Probably like, get you a lot more jobs too. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. great. I mean, it's like. I love tapas. I love to yeah. have a few different kinds of meals, you know, yeah. like a few different kinds of tastes. And I don't want to do the same thing for too long. And that variety is like, that's why we do it. Like, And before I move on to the other stuff that I want to talk about, you mentioned, I know you said you're, you're kind of, you're a foodie, yeah? I love food, yeah. What's, what's, your, what's your food of choice? What If you got to go, like, net, let's, I know that a lot of times that if you're working on set and it's like one of those things, you just got to go and grab a fast thing, sure. But if you have an opportunity, you take your meal. What's your meal? What's your place? Well, oh, like a restaurant? Yeah, no, but just like, you know, a particular, is it Italian food? Is it a... Is, well, again, it's variety. I'm like all over the place, yeah, right? Yeah. Like I love every different kind of food. Like yesterday I made, you know, some organic steak and I made like my favorite salad right now, which is arugula with like this mustard vinaigrette dressing and pomegranates and um, uh, cheese and uh, olives and onions and it's really tasty. See, I mean that's what I mean. <laughs> it's, but that's and, but it's that stuff though too, right? That it's like the the is cooking something that you do because some people a lot of people do cooking to relax. So if like yeah. you're whether it's after a, an intense job or whether yeah. it's something you just kind of you know what I'm going to take a week off I'm just going to chill I'm going to cook a lot of people do that yeah well when I'm filming it's like I forget to buy groceries and everything goes off and then I'm just ordering takeout or I'm just like crashing I'm just like going straight to sleep yeah um but when I'm not working I really I do I love to cook and I I love to put on a podcast or put on music and like cook and there's a sort of like rhythm that you can get into and what's your podcast of choice I like um, big thing, right? Smart, oh. yeah. I don't know. Am I allowed to promote other <laughs> of podcasts? Of course, podcast? of course you can. Of course you can. Of course you can. Do you want that? Uh, I, I, this show is me. I want to know more about you. I want to know more about if you, whatever you listen to. I don't, you know. Of course, I like Smartless. Okay, I like Smartless, and I like some of the NPR little news snippets. And yeah, things like that. If I want to stay up to date. Smart. I mean, I think that's uh, it's it's amazing too. I do the same thing. I listen to my a friend of mine is Josh Harwitz. I listen to his show when I'm when I'm doing a, a, a drive a long drive that I do on Tuesdays, and I listen to his show and uh, interviews and stuff that he does. So absolutely, and and in, and speaking and staying in the same thing. What what are some of the shows that you're watching? What are some of the movies that you kind of do to wind down? Watch in general. What are you really like locked into? I'm one of those people that I watch the same thing over and over again. Like what? Um, Red Dwarf, which is a British sci-fi comedy from England okay. that I grew up watching. I just really loved it because it's like it's about like the distant future and like these people of like they they were on a mining ship in space and they they lost track of the ship and the only human left is this like biracial guy from Manchester with dreadlocks and he's like <laughs> Wearing a punk jacket. Yeah. It's like so cool. It's from yeah. the 80s yeah. and actually they're still making it. 
Um, and I always loved Dave Lister. He's one of my favorite characters of all time. And so you go back and revisit and watch I watch that. it all the time. Amazing. I watch Peep Show. It's another British comedy okay. all the time. Is this Seinfeld. stuff you watched with your dad when you were younger too? With my dad yeah. and then now like all the time. The Mighty Boosh. Just weird stuff like that. Hey, Amen. Um, but I did. I loved White Lotus. Okay. Um, I love... Uh, that I really, really loved recently. Oh, I like revisited this movie, Morvan Callow with Samantha Morton. It's her first one. Oh, film. okay. Another weird one. Yeah, it's, it's weird that, stuff. I like that. It's cool. I it's like great. weird stuff. Well, that's also one of the things I like to do on the show. I like to tell people, kind of open their up to new stuff that they wouldn't have heard of before. Maybe maybe people do know what it is too. So that's that's amazing. That's it's for me. I'm I'm obsessed with The Last of Us, like everybody else right now. Yeah, I need to get into that. It's great. It's really good. But let's talk about you talking about like science fiction. You are talking about you know just and we were talking about how so you do a lot of intense stuff too. Um, Infinity Pool that, that checks off all the boxes for that sure one. Sure does. Science fiction, and I'm not going to spoil stuff for people who haven't seen the movie too, but I wanted to talk about working with Alexander Skarsgård. Uh, he's one of my favorites, man. Like, Northman was on my list yeah, last I loved year. It. it was really great. Um, and I always feel like, after watching it, was it was a Pretty Little Liars? Is that what it was? The, no, um, pretty, what, what's it? Big Little Lies. Big Little Lies. I always get the, I always get the, I, I knew, I knew, that's why I asked. That's why I asked because I knew I got it wrong, but I know, but, but I'm Maybe in the right he show. Was on pretty little nah, little he's in, he, you're, you, you hit it, you hit it right. It's, it's definitely that one. Um, but I know the show well. I know that he was married to Nicole Kidman in it. That's right. Right. See, they so made I know magic the show. In that show. They did, but that's why I got nervous when you were his wife. I always nervous for anybody who plays his, his wife, wife now. Yeah. So um, I thought it was an honor. I was like, cool. Yeah. I mean, because he's always, he's always, there's always something with a kind of, it's not, it's not to that level of intensity, obviously, but it's still like a, what, what, he seems like a pretty intense dude. And it's, did you know him beforehand? No. So how, what's that process like meeting him going, all right, this guy's got to play my husband. I'm always fascinated by that. Like how people, you know, who's supposed to be married and do this kind of relationship. How, how does that, what's that process like with him? Well, we were all in Hungary, um, getting ready to shoot and we all just went out for a drink. He's very chill. Yeah. He's actually not intense at all. Okay. He does it well. He, he, yeah. yeah. He's a good actor. He's really a good. very, very chill person. I love that. So you guys, and, and so you do that. And what, what was it about, I mean, obviously you're working with Crumber, but what, what, what is it about that particular um, script and the movie that you go, oh yeah, I, this, this I need to do like immediately? It was such an original piece of like sci-fi horror. Yeah. And I was already a fan of Brandon Cronenberg. Um yeah, I, I watched Antiviral, I watched Possessor. I, as soon as it hit my email, I was like already probably going to say yes. Yeah. Um, he just has this, he's such a visionary. It, it's, it's, it's fun, but it's like saying something, but it's like allowing you to decide really mm -hmm. what it's saying as well. And, you know, it's intense stuff. And it he is. really, really goes there, but in a stylistic way. Yeah. And, I, and I think... That's always something that I aim for, and I don't know. I was just just a fan. Yeah. Well, what's your preference, though? Because you've done, as we just mentioned, with comedies and um, horror, thrillers, dramas. I, I guess it's kind of a cliche answer. If I'm answering myself as saying that, I guess it, it just matters on the script itself. But do you have a preference on what you like to do the most? No. No, I think my career kind of says that, where yeah. it's just kind of all different stuff. I mean, for me, the characters are all talking to each other in a way, but that's more just for me. I don't know if that comes across in any way. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I do, like, lately I've been playing more intense, like, M, M Foster yes. in Infinity Pool, she's very buttoned up, and that was a certain kind of energy. And, like, to be of service to that script, like, that was my position and then it's been really satisfying since then to explore these really intense kind of volatile characters. Yeah. And one of them is Vanessa and a lot of nothing. And then I have another one coming out, um, which is a mini series for FX called Sterling. Clippers, Clippers. Sorry, the whole the whole drama that went down with the Clippers. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And then that I was going to definitely ask you about that as well, too. Yeah. Because I remember when all that went down. Like, can yeah. you t how much of that or can you actually talk about? It? Um, I'm not sure. Okay, <laughs> let's let's talk about whatever. Like, as far as that, because like you said, that's another intense um, character here now too. Yeah. And I remember when all that went down and being in being in LA, and um, yeah. So what is what's did you were you familiar with everything that obviously went down with him and and? I was, I was, I think it was about 10 years ago when I first moved to LA. So I do remember it happening, but I didn't really understand the details of it. I, we all saw the Barbara Walters interview. Yes. With v, and 
you know, I think we all judged her a certain way and there might be reasons for that, but through the process of making the show, I really understand her a lot de- more deeply, I think, and I have a lot more empathy for her. Interesting. That's what. I, how do you shake these characters? Because, like you said, you 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 have you do so much with them, and you have to like really prep with it. How do you shake it? I think that a lot of people who are not into who aren't actors don't understand that a piece of these people live with you. How yeah. do you, like especially in like intense roles like this? I'm always so fascinated and 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 in awe of what you guys can do when you really go down that route. Um, how do you shake some of these characters and do you want to sometimes? Well, first of all, I think it's important, like, if you're able to, you know, if you get to a, a lucky position where you're able to pick and choose, like, you don't want to go there for no reason. Yeah. You want to go there for something that you really believe in. It, it, it's it's tough. It's like 2 a.m. and you're going there. Like, that's a lot of mental right. acrobatics and physical. Um, so you have to always be able to, come back to that initial reason as to why you're there why the cameras are there why are we doing this and that's why it's really important to pick stuff that you really believe in otherwise you're phoning it in at 2 a.m yeah yeah it's it's just it always i watch some of these roles and i'm just like man you got to get to such a place and as you said and even when you when you're working the crew is is crying and and yeah, all that it's and it's, it's it is a big investment is emotionally yeah well for me it's lemonade you know like we all have our experiences in life and i am grateful that i have an outlet i'm so happy that i'm an artist i think you know to be able to like all of the experiences we have some negative some positive some in between i'm able to mine from those experiences and make use of them and, and throw them away and like give them to a project and and it's so cathartic it's um it's self-reflective and it's cathartic and i think quite healing as well because you want to do i mean because you're producing and you're doing and are are there so directing is that that's possibly next that's something that i'm exploring yeah yeah anything in particular that you can tease us that you really want to well there is a film that i've been working on for some time that's kind of music based in the punk genre um it's another like really uh, kind of volatile, interesting, complicated character that you sort of are infuriated with, but you root for. Um, I love that you go after those types of characters. I really do. That's really my wheelhouse yeah. now. That's really what interests me, at least now, at least for now. Um, so let's talk about what you can't talk about, but we'll do it in a way that you. That I'm going to do a little trick I'll here. Just blink and. 100. Um, percent I don't. You, you can't. You can't. I know you can't talk about it um, as. Uh, but let's talk about Zack Snyder in general as far as his style of film and things that you've seen in the past. And what, what do you think makes him such like this kind of, he's such a visionary filmmaker, the way he sets things up and, and not in a particular thing that you were working on, but things in the past. What do you think it is about Zack that, you know, just that people, because he's obviously, he's got legions of fans. Like what is it? Why do people respond to him the way that he, I, I mean, I can only really speak from my personal experience, and that's that he's really enthusiastic. Yeah. He's really into it. Like, he lives and breathes it. Um, and that comes across. He's very imaginative, and I guess his inner child is alive and well. I don't know. You'd have to ask him. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, Re- Rebel Moon um, is something that a lot of people, obviously, is coming out in December. People are very excited about it. And science fiction and, and all that, where they were talking about with – you know, at one point he was rumored for Star Wars, and then this came about. Let's talk about Star Wars. It has nothing to do with this. So in Star Wars... Are you in, tricking me? I am not tricking I would not do that. <laughs> um, Star Wars in general, because I know from... That's also one of the reasons I asked about the other things that you watched when you were a kid and other things. Were you in, into any of the big kind of, you know, blockbuster things, whether it was a Star Wars or even throwing towards like a, a Jurassic Park or a oh, Indiana yeah. Jones, or that yeah, kind of I stuff? Loved, yeah, I loved Star Wars. I mean, there was nothing like going and renting a video from the video right, store. Right. Kids, I don't know if you know about that, but <laughs> something we used to do. Um, yeah, my dad would take me on like a Sunday and I get to rent something for yeah. a week. Sometimes I would just rent The Little Mermaid over and over again. That's just awesome. renew it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I loved like the Terminator, and I loved I, Jurassic Park. Scared the bejesus out of me. Did it? Yeah, yeah, I remember. I had to sleep in my parents' bed, and every shadow I thought was a T Rex. <laughs> I remember that very specifically. That's amazing. Well, I mean, because the reason I asked whether this movie comes out in December and it's good, this big science fiction thing, and as you said, you've opened the door to doing a whole bunch of uh, different um, characters and genres and things. 
is something like DC movies and Marvel movies and Star Wars movies, is that something you'd want to open yourself up to? Or do you prefer to play, like, you know, you did this big thing in December and then you go back to doing this other type of stuff that you really like the kind of character driven stuff that you've been doing recently. Well, I think why not both? You, you know, go. I think there's a world in which you can do both. Um, I would definitely be open to that realm. It just depends on the character. It would need to be, yeah, a specific kind of character that spoke to me, I think. All right. Well, look, I'm so excited that you had a chance to come in here today. And I was, uh, I, when Perry, my good friend Perry Nemiroff, told me that we had a chance to speak to you, I said, please. And I'm so excited to see what happens in December. And I hope that I can talk to you about it when you can talk about it. I hope it. so, too. Um, thank you so much for joining me. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, please, please, please check out all of the, I mean, you just heard of all the work that Cleopatra Coleman has done. Please go and check it out. Thank you once again for joining me. Thank you so much. Back to me, me. <laughs> See, I told you. How cool is she? She's awesome. She came in here with her dad. Dad was awesome too. Australian, dude, just chilling. I mean, you got to be pretty chill and awesome to, to name your daughter Cleopatra. It's great. It's really great. And and she and she owns it, man. She owns it. I can't wait to see Rebel Moon, and to check out all. And even the the shoot me the Clipper story. She got great stuff going on. So once again, let me hear your comments in there. What did you think about Cleopatra? Did you like the interview? Did you dig it? Uh, do you want to see more interviews? Because I want to do more. So let me know. All right, let's move on. We'll probably call at the end of the day with this story. Um, Shazam, right? Shazam, right now is not tracking well from what they say, or light, I should say, not not necessarily not well, but they're tracking light. And this doesn't surprise me. I think I mentioned this to someone yesterday when I was talking about this movie. It's so up in the air right now with the DCU in general, and it doesn't have Michael Keaton as Batman returning. So if, just to make this clear, if The Flash doesn't have Michael Keaton in it, I don't care how good the movie is, it's not getting this kind of hype from the audience. Um, and sh because of, because of not, not necessarily with all the stuff that Ezra Miller has done, which is a certainly a big portion of it, but because there isn't a lot of hype behind the movies that are not connected to this new thing. So people don't really don't know what it is. And they're just kind of like standalone things. They're not really connected to anything necessarily. So here's, here's the story from Dark Horizons regarding... Shazam. It's the, the article legit says Shazam sequel tracking for a soft start. DC's Shazam Fury of the Guards of the Guards of the Gods sequel has early tracking projections and those early numbers suggest that the film could fall a little short of its predecessor. According to the box office pro, forecasted projections for the film see it currently tracking to earn between 43 and 52 million for its opening 3-day weekend. To put that in perspective, the original did 53.5 in 2019, which at the time was the DCEU's lowest opening. The pandemic subsequently changed all of that with Wonder Woman in late 2020 and the Suicide Squad in 2021, fearing much worse. Yeah, but that doesn't really count. Thanks to good reviews and word of mouth, though, Shazam ended up earning a solid $363 million worldwide, which led to a sequel being greenlit. The film faces the difficulty of being rendered immaterial by the recently announced plans for the new DCEU. Excuse me, new DCU. In addition, it doesn't have the drawing power of either The Flash or the Aquaman sequel, which are both expected to have major openings. These are early projections, though, and will likely get closer to release. Press and the short-term um, push for the film are about to begin. So, yeah, um, this doesn't surprise me. Plus the fact, the other thing that should be mentioned is that even The Flash... And someone asked me yesterday if Flash was going to make a billion. I said, I don't know. Only because of where it is. It, it lands in June. And a week later, it's got one week off. And then a week later, it's got Indiana Jones. And then a week after that, it's got, or, or it's like Insidious. And then followed by Insidious is, is uh, Mission Impossible. So it's got a hard journey in the summer to try to overcome to get to a billion. But it very well might, depending how good it is. Um. Shazam is also in a very tough spot for everything that they mentioned there with the, you know, it's not this type of sequel that, and Zach Levi is, he's talented, but he's not like a major star. 
I mean, he he's not he's and not that not that Ezra Miller is, um, but. Again, Michael Keaton, the Flash carries more weight to me, as they said, than Shazam does also. And the other big issue is that it is coupled in a march that is full of bangers. I mean, you look at Creed and, and in all over the different a different map with, with genres too. Creed 3, um, Scream 6, Dungeons and & Dragons, and there's like one other one that I'm missing, right? something else that's coming out in 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 March and it's like it's just stacked week two there's that new Adam Driver movie also and it's like it's just stacked and the two I would say that the ones that are gonna do the best in that and, and John Wick did I say John Wick I think I said John Wick but John Wick Creed 3 Dungeons and Dragons Scream 6 all of those movies Shazam's coming in last out of all of those I mean, Scream Six is going to have a major, a major opening. Um, I think, I think that that one's going to have a major, especially now with, with how big Jenna Ortega is. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons is the only one that it could potentially beat. And I was talking to someone about this yesterday. I can't remember who it was, and they said, oh, "I think, I think that movie's going to bomb." I said, "I don't know. I, said, I don't know if it's going to bomb." Dungeons, Dungeons and Dragons, that is, because. It offers a counterbalance to a lot of different things. It also allows, it also, I mean, also don't discount how big the Dungeons and Dragons fan base is. And I know that there's a controversy with Dungeons and Dragons with whatever the game. I don't think it's going to carry over that big. It also has a very different kind of Knight's Tale feel to it. And it also will play to the younger generation as well. My 11 year old sees the poster and goes, Oh my God, I can't wait to see that. And it's just kind of geeking out over it. So, I do think that between that, I'd love to see what that's tracking at. If I, I this, but this is my guess for March, as far as the overall box office goes, I think it's going to be John Wick is the, the winner out of all of them. Then Scream, then Creed, um, then Dungeons and Dragons, and then Shazam. Out of those big releases, that's that's what I think. I'm very curious to hear what you guys think. If you think that's gonna is is that close? Curious, but. Um, I do have an. I guess I do have another story that we can talk about here. They, there's well, there's two. Venom and uh, and Shang Chi apparently going to start shooting soon. Venom three and Shang Chi two. I guess that's what they say. So well, this filming talk, and here it is. Actor Tom Hardy has confirmed that pre-production is underway on the third Venom movie, and the actor took to Instagram to confirm the news, along with showing off a deleted scene from the first movie. That scene shows Eddie Brock arguing with Venom to try and enter a hospital, leading to Hardy arguing and physically fighting with himself on a sidewalk as perplexed pedestrians scurry past. Venom 3 is going to be directed by Kelly Marcel, who's also writing the film with Hardy, returning to the role and filming to run from June to September this year in the UK. That would suggest a late 2024 release for the film. In less concrete scheduling news, a new report from insider Casey Walsh via The Direct indicates that Shang-Chi and the Eternal sequels have been added to the Marvel Studios production calendar with development officially underway and plans for the filming. Interesting, because the Eternals, they hadn't really talked much about. The big question, of course, is when. Reports back in 2021 suggested the film was aiming to begin production this year ahead of 2025. That became questionable following Phase 5 and 6 slate, revealing indicating the first film's director, Destin Dendel Critton, was attached to direct the Avengers Kang Dynasty along with the, under, the undated Shang-Chi follow-up. Kang is currently slated for 2025 release, and Marvel has three unannounced film slots set for July 2025, November 2025, and February 2026. Um, I think those will probably come at Comic-Con also, right? I don't think they're doing D23 this year, and if last year was any indication, um, they care way more about Comic-Con than they care their own about their own um, convention, which I think is crazy. Everybody thought D23 was going to be the big announcement thing from everybody, but they really, Marvel came out to shine at, at D23, excuse me, at Comic-Con, and Star Wars, the majority of their stuff came out at Celebration, which was probably more accurate for them to do, but there was not really a lot of big news that came out at D23, so I don't think D23 is even happening this year. So I would say that that slate is probably announced in... Um, in at Comic Con, and you probably from these reports, you're probably going to get an announcement of both the release date for Shang Chi two and Eternals two. I'm very curious. That's the one thing I would like to be in that hall 
when they announce it to see what kind of reaction. Shang-Chi 2 will get, a big, will get a big reaction when they announce it, but I wonder what kind of reaction Eternals will get. I happen to really like the Eternals. I think I'm one of the few people that do. Um, but I'm curious what that would get, what kind of reaction. Um, and this is the very last story. Here's the very last story. This is this is something a little bit more TV-related. I don't have Roxy here today, but we can talk about the news. And that is that there was, you know, just what we just watched, um, what the hell was it? it? The Last of Us. And inside of it, I don't know if you guys watched True Blood, but um, the character of Tara was was in was in um, was the character Maria in The Last of Us, and she was great in both shows. But they talked about potentially that True Blood was going to have a spinoff, and that maybe Succession was going to have a spinoff series. And you look at what the popularity of what House of the Dragon did that they thought maybe they were going to do that. So HBO and HBO Max content CEO Casey Bloys has offered an update on multiple spinoff and reboot projects in the works at the premium cable, and it looks like the cost cutting at Warner Brothers Discovery is now taking its toll. First up, he confirms a variety that the rumored Six Feet Under and True Blood revivals are both dead. Bloys said Under was never really in the works, which suggests it was mostly just speculating. He adds that a True Blood reboot or revival was considered with HBO developing a few scripts. However, nothing felt like it got there and the plans have now been abandoned. There are also no plans for a Mayor of Easttown sequel. That stinks. As creator Brad Ingsleby, who has an exclusive overall deal the network, is now doing a crime-centric show for HBO. Whilst the network did proceed with a Game of Thrones spinoff, don't expect Succession to do the same. The show's upcoming fourth season could be its last, although not confirmed. And whether or not it is, Boyce is not entertaining any spinoff ideas. I don't think so. I don't, I always say never say never. When we started talking about doing a Thrones prequel, that was something that HBO had historically never done. I had some people internally saying, this is crazy. What are you doing? That said, I think that there's something about the universe that George created that lent itself to spinoffs. There's a huge history, a lot of different families, a lot of different wars and and battles. It doesn't, seem to me that there's something in succession where you would go, let's just follow this kid or whatever. It doesn't seem like a natural thing to me. But if Jesse Armstrong said, I want to do this, then I would follow his lead. Boyce had a similar sentiment towards Watchmen, saying he has no interest in bringing it back and anyone other than executive producer Damon Lindelof. Watchmen was his creation. If he doesn't think there's a story that he wants to put his heart and soul into, it's hard for me to think that it would be worth doing. It was a very special limited series for us. I would put it in the pantheon of HBO greats. If Damon ever wanted to revisit it, he knows that it's an open door, but it's hard for me to imagine doing one without him. I respect those answers. I respect those answers. It's like, you know, there are a lot of people, and I think it's what makes HBO special, right? And a lot of people that would just like, hey, we need something. We got to take, the, oh, that was popular. I don't care what it is. Put it in. Put it into production. You don't want to taint what came before and so I, I respect it and true blood i had mentioned when i when i was reviewing the last of us i watched true blood for the first i think like two or three seasons and i liked it it just got really ridiculous after this third season in my opinion i just i don't i couldn't even tell you anything about it but it got so it was like a soap opera after a while but it started off really really good and kind of interesting um but that's one that you could i mean you could spin that off maybe but i guess they're not going to do it succession Hard for me to speak on. That's one of the shows that I have to go back and watch because I watched like the first three or four episodes, loved them, just never got back into watching it. Um, so I have to go back and watch that. And I would. I don't know if, if it's if you know, maybe he's a hundred percent right of like how do you do you want to spin off just one particular character? I mean, who would get who would get it? But I mean, look, they did the same thing with House of the Dragon. I think the House of the Dragon they benefit from just focusing on one on one family as opposed to so many different. I think that that was one of the things about the, one of the criticisms of game of Thrones is sometimes you're just jumping from character to character, to character, to character that you're like, Whoa, this is a lot where this is one family you're focused on. House of the dragon was one of my favorite. It was my favorite show last year. Hands down. I love, I mean, I loved that show. Love that show. Um, One of the best seasons of television that I've seen in a long time. There's a lot of great television last year between that, the bear, um, Severance, Andor, I mean, there's some great stuff last year. Great stuff. So I'm excited to hear more of it. And then, and I guess does 1883 count as last year? Or was it the year before? I don't know, but I just watched 1883 this the other the other day, and I'm I'm obsessed with that show. I loved that show. So I'm at the finish with 1923. 
And it was kind of a longer episode, I think, because of the, uh, the, the interview. But, man, what a great interview. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed the show in general. Once again, guys, if you haven't already done this, make sure that you subscribe to the channel. Show a little. Speaking of showing a little, show a little class and get a show a little class shirt or whatever it might be. Spotify, we're on video, man. So check that out. Make sure you go there. Go on Spotify. Do what you got to do. Patreon.com slash The Big Thing Show. A lot of changes coming soon to the website. We're going to be launching a website. We're going to talk about all the live events and everything we got going on. But thank you guys so much for joining me on today's show. I appreciate you. Uh, leave a comment. I'll try to get back to you. And we'll see you tomorrow. Capes and Cows with my special guest, Katie O'Brien. All right, everybody. Peace. Peace.